Okay, we've got three wines in front of us and Joy Merrilies, who is the Director of Winemaking and Production at Sa Shannon Ridge Family Wines, is going to lead the show here. Great, thank you all for being here. We're super excited, this is a fun event. Like Glenn said, uh, we've been working on this for almost a year now and, and it's all coming together, so. All right, so this was, who's the champ? Lightweight versus heavyweight. There was some debate about this. We, uh, we tried to get the biggest crop load we could, but in the end, Mother Nature takes over. So we, um, I'll give you a little background to what we did. So this is Red Hills fruit. Um, it was planted in 2004. Uh, VSP, north-south row direction, Sauvignon Blanc clone one on 101.14, pretty standard. And so we did, um, we tried to, you know, everyone says that doing this before Verasion, doing the crop trials before Verasion is really important. So we aimed for that. We shoot thinned on May 30th. And then uh, July 7th, is uh, when we did the fruit thinning, and then July 30th was when we started seeing Verasion in that vineyard. So, next slide. Here's some little photos I remembered to take during harvest. And uh, so we were aiming for eight tons to the acre. I think that's maybe a little bit more standard in, in some spots in Lake County, but uh, when we actually crunched out the numbers, it ended up being six. That was our high end. So uh, we left it as is. We hardly did anything to it. We did leaf the fruiting zone. That was it. So four tons per acre. We did, um, we suckered two shoots per spur. Uh, we pulled the weak shoots and we left no doubles. And, and then we thinned to two clusters per shoot. And that was it. It's pretty simple. That's what it looked like. And then for the two tons per acre, we um, did the same thing as the four tons per acre, two shoots per spur, pulled the weak shoots, and then we thinned it down to one cluster per spur, or one cluster per shoot. And um, so you can see, it's you know pretty open canopy. We did the same leafing on everything. And um, yeah, so we, we decided to, I think Anita will talk a little bit more about this, but we decided to pick them all on the same day instead of trying to pick at the equivalent bricks. Because if you're gonna have a bigger crop load, it's gonna take longer to ripen. The bricks are gonna be different than if it's a smaller crop load, right? Makes sense. We debated back and forth many times on what, how we should do this. And we thought, well, you know what? Let's just make this decision, go for it. Maybe next year we'll try it the other way, see how it happens. So um, I wanted to do this tasting blind but it was really difficult to give you all of the information and then to taste it blind. So um, feel free to taste through, and, and I'm sure you can probably guess the order, but, um, but we'll sort of reveal the order once, it's, once we're finished. Joy, are you gonna taste? Yeah. I'm back. Okay, so um, something to point out that I probably should have pointed out. So we made these wines in our research and experimental wine, winery. So everything was done in stainless steel, right? For us, we try and do really straightforward winemaking to only express the fruit as much as possible and not specifically trying to make the most complex wine in the world, but really showing whatever characteristic we're investigating. So you'll see um, here the winemaking exactly the same as before uh, for the previous trial. Um, if you look at the juice data, as Joy was saying, they came in at different soluble so solids. So it makes sense that your two tons per acre was a little bit riper. There was about a one and a half bricks difference between the two tons an acre and the six tons an acre. And it also resulted in an increase in pH for the two tons and a decrease in 
tetrahedral acidity, just as you would expect for something that's slightly riper. So I had a lot of interesting conversations in Marlborough, I just came back from two and a half weeks there, about different yield trials. And so, you know, and there's people there that's convinced that you have to pick them all at the same ripeness because the only difference you're seeing is actually ripeness differences, not yield differences, especially if your vine was still balanced, it's in within that range. And they quoted me studies that prove this. So when I got back, I looked at those studies and then I searched further. Also got studies that showed exactly the opposite. <laughs> so they all had different ranges of yields that they kept on the vine and how they did it and where it was done and varieties, right? So perhaps we should do it the other way around and see. <laughs> so I'm just saying there's an argument both ways, right? So yes, it could have had an impact. So keep that in mind. If you look at the wine data, that difference in ripeness resulted in a 0.7% difference in alcohol. That is pretty low, okay? Most consumers would not be able to notice that difference in alcohol content. The rest of the barometers, because we acidulated the wines, very similar now. So there really is only that slight alcohol differences among the wines that you're gonna taste, or you're tasting. So I just wanted to show you, this, these are our fermentation graphs of all the different reps we did once again in duplicate, showing that the differences you're seeing are not due to fermentation differences. It's only due to the grapes. So now I don't have to explain what this is because you've seen it once before, right? So once again, we did methoxypyrazine analysis all below detectable levels, okay? I'm not saying they're not there. I'm just saying on a parts per, actually that's a trillion level, we couldn't see it, okay? Bullion. So the, the thing is, it's very, very low levels. They have very low thresholds, but I really don't believe they're contributing to the aromas you're seeing in these wines. If you look at the grape varietal aroma compounds, those are the terpenes. Um, and you look at the fermentation aromas, those are the hierocols and the esters mostly, some fatty acids. What you'll see here is, for the two tons per acre, that's the two AMB, you'll see there in the top corner, they had more terpenes, okay? Meaning, terpenes are supposed to give you citrus floral characters, and then they had some fermentation esters, which will give you more the generic fruity, and at higher concentrations, it could go to tropical characteristics, okay? The four tons an acre gave you more fermentation esters, meaning that you're gonna see first the tropical fruity aromas and perhaps undertone of the citrus floral type of characters, okay? That's what the data says. And then the six ton per acre, if you look at that, they really had more fatty acids, they're gonna be much more subdued, they had less terpenes, less fermentation esters. They will still have some of those aromas because none of them has just one group of compounds and none of the other, it's the levels off that differ, okay? So if you taste these wines now and you go through them, I just told you what the data says. Can you identify in what, which order you're tasting them? Yes, Don? Um, so because we acidulated them at different levels, we were aiming for six grams a liter, it did change the pHs closer to each other. Okay. So this was interesting when we made these wines. When we were tasting them initially, just after the completion of fermentation, we thought that we mislabeled them. And why? Because what we expected to see in a six tons versus a two tons per acre were totally switched around. They kept evolving until they got to this stage and now they've been there the last few months. So now it's more what I would expect to see from these um, yields. But you know, it went through an interesting ride to get here. That's all I would say. Um, so I personally would say that um, no, I don't want to say my preference because I'm going to influence you guys. We should take a poll. We should poll the audience. Can we poll? Yeah, we can poll. You're not shy, right? Yeah, no, no, no. So, 
As you know, from left to right, you had two tons per acre, four tons per acre, and six tons per acre. No. 642? Okay, see, I didn't, okay, so 642, sorry. Take it back. So, where do I start? Who preferred the six tons per acre? Did you hear that? Joy said, who, how many of you are growers? <laughs> Unconscious bias. <laughs> who preferred the four tons per acre? Impressive. Who preferred the two tons per acre? You know, I always, I think there's people here that lifted their hands more than once. I'm just saying. <laughs> Did you taste them both ways? Um, it's pretty easy. I, I have to say, I personally think all three are really nice wines. They're different wine styles. And, you know, and it's really going to depend on your personal um, preference as well as your personal biases, I would say, will influence you as well because you know what they are. You know what you're tasting. But I think they're all interesting wines. And I have nothing against the same six tons per acre or the four tons or the two tons. And actually, as I've been tasting them, as they evolved, my opinion about which one I prefer kept changing. So this is why I don't even want to say which one I like because it keeps changing every time I taste them. Because I really do think they're all good wines. I, I think it depends on my mood. Have a question? Yes. Oh, why we did you have to ask that? I have no idea. Um, so we looked at our conversion rates, you know, um, sugar to ethanol, alcohol conversion rates for the yeast, and it was really high. We checked it and rechecked it. Uh, so my personal opinion is the wines, we could check and recheck and recheck, and I trust that number. It may mean that the grape number wasn't as representative of that load as we thought. That's the only thing I can think. So do we have any other questions for our panel about uh, any of the sensory or aroma characteristics of these wines? No? No? Everyone's Lynn. content? There's one in the back. Oh, let me run the mic back to Glenn. Sorry, okay. I should have done that. Let me just trot back here. So, so my question is really kind of for the uh, the growers who are with winemaking and or acquiring fruit. So, what kind of instructions do you give when you're trying to get a quality, you know, different price point wines? Is it about the vineyard? Is it about the fruit load? Do you give growers instructions about how you want fruit drop, uh, canopy management? What kind of things do you think are really important if we're going to make quality Sauvignon Blanc? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it, and a couple of growers came up and talked about the clonal and the what and, the, and who what they would plant, you know, from the previous tasting, and and I think, um, you know, the the problem was. Sauvignon Blanc, it's not just these levels of tonnage. It's what the price point is and what the consumer is willing to pay. But beyond that, when you think of Sauvignon Blanc and where it's grown, because it's so versatile, it could be competing with Cabernet. It could be competing with Syrah. It could be competing with Chardonnay. It could be competing with Pinot Noir. And I've seen that throughout California. And so you know, if you don't have some amount of yield, internally it's like we need this yield based on that price point, and we have to fix the vineyard, you know, to be properly balanced 
to hit those targets. At the very highest price points, when it's $45, $60 a bottle, there's no, you do whatever you have to do. But at the other ones, you, I mean, as, as growers, we all have to be profitable. But it's not just the Sauvignon Blanc yield, it's what it's competing with in the market. I'll take the opportunity to add one more comment. To, um, you know, we, we tend to talk, I think, in rather simple terms about, um, I'm just going to choose one that's floating around here. It's tons per acre. I haven't ha heard anyone speak to what the capacity of a vine is. And I've seen vineyards uh, get into really a lot of trouble when um, the winemaker comes out and wants to drive to a magic number of tons per acre, and the vineyard has more capacity than that. And um, the vines actually get completely out of whack. And um, then sometimes the winemaker basically says, OK, well, this isn't going to fit our program. We need to go somewhere else to look for fruit. So we need to have, I, I think we need to have some way to integrate these objectives more closely into the final, not, and I hate to use the word quality. We're really talking about wine styles here. And get the style fit from the vineyard right through to the wine, and then get the vineyard in sensitive kind of balance to what its capacity is and to make that style of wine. So I get really nervous about tons per acre, for example. I'm really curious about cluster weights, berry weights, um, what, the, what the final wines really look like. And to me, yield is kind of getting to managing those other components, uh, not just the yield itself. So as the token grower, the more the merrier, right? But um, it, I don't remember the last time a winery came into one of our vineyards and told us to drop fruit in Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and so I think that's a function of us learning what those what the balance is, what's appropriate, and you know taking care of all that when we prune and do other you know, canopy management functions. But, uh, you know, un unless it's a year when there's water barrier or something like that, then we, of course, go through right before harvest and clean that up. But that only happens rarely, and it's, I think, more a function of nutrition than it is of yield. So. I think, too, don't forget, this is a Red Hills appellation for this fruit that we tasted today. So it's very volcanic soil. It's not a typical place for Sauvignon Blanc to be grown in Lake County. And I think, you know, maybe in the future we do something side by side or we do, you know, kind of a Red Hills versus Big Valley because I know that Big Valley can hang a lot more tons because um, we heard about all the soils and the climate down there today. And, you know, and actually do them side by side because I think we would get very different results growing this in the, or doing the same trial in a different location. And I think that may speak to what variety you would plant. I mean, often Sauvignon Blanc is planted on sites that are more vigorous, so they can handle more yield. And you wouldn't put, let's say, a red in there because it wouldn't be as balanced. So. Okay. I just want a last reminder: complete your preference, and you can only select one. <laughs>